detector for gas tungsten arc welding uh, 1780. This is our basic gas tungsten arc welding class. Uh, I'm looking at page 681, chapter 19 in your textbook. Um, this chapter covers this, the same material that we do in the course. And it will, it'll do aluminum, carbon, stainless, but in addition to that it talks about magnesium, titanium, and copper. Uh, we're going to focus on the big three, the three that we teach. Um, this book presents it in a, in a different order than, than what you're going through it, but it, it still uh, covers all of it. Um, it's a good little chapter. It's a little long, but I'm only going to cover the first 20 pages. Uh, after that, it gets into how they want you to practice and so forth. Uh, you're welcome to read that and see the, the hints and the ideas and, and, and their suggestions on how you should do these welds. But uh, as far as your test is concerned, we're basically going to stop at about page 700 on your test. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you when to, uh, when to uh, uh, terminate that. But in that 20 pages, we're going to have about 40 questions. So whenever I say, okay, you might want to highlight this or put a bullet by, by that, it would behoove you to do that because uh, otherwise you may miss something. And always remember, too, that not all of the questions on your test are, will be things that, that come out of the textbook, as I've re repeatedly said many times. Uh, I like to put other things in there, real-world experiences that you can encounter uh, once you leave here and you get out there and start welding. Uh, and if I tell you to make a note, then I suggest you make that note because you may find that uh, particular item on your test. So, beginning on page 681, gas tungsten arc welding. Of course, GTAW is short for gas tungsten arc welding. And uh, I showed this slide in our last chapter, but I wanted to refresh everybody's memory with it. And here we have a picture of a guy doing some TIG welding. I can't really tell what he's welding on, but it's not a very big item. And then here we have the TIG welding torch and nomenclature that refers to all the terms that are associated with gas tungsten arc welding. Um, this happens to be a dry rig, the same kind of a rig that you're using in your welding booths. Uh, if it were a water-cooled rig, you'd see more you'd see at least uh, one other line coming in through there. So we have the uh, back cap, the torch body, the collet body, the nozzle, and so forth and so on. Um, reading from your book, on this first page in the first column, we have uh, a number of, uh, of things I want you to pay attention to. Under aluminum, I'm reading, I'm reading the second paragraph. Pay attention to these uh, melting temperatures. Aluminum melts at 1,218 degrees Fahrenheit, and its oxide melts at about 2,700 degrees. If you remember from our previous conversation, I talked about how if you take a piece of aluminum and you set it out in the sun, in the atmosphere, there's a chemical reaction. Just like iron will rust, aluminum gets an oxide film over top of it, and it's very hard. And you've got to break that oxide down or else you can't reach the aluminum itself to, to, to weld it. And that oxide melts at 3,700 degrees while the aluminum, it's, aluminum will melt at 1,218. Uh, in comparison, mild steel melts at about 2,800 degrees and copper melts at 1,980 degrees. So um, commit those to memory. Uh, they'll be on, on your test. And it says that the oxide must be removed prior to welding. And this can be done mechanically chemically or with a cleaning action um, of the welding arc. And the cleaning action will come through your AC, the alternating current. Remember that when, when the alternating current is on the DC side, DC electrode positive side, 70% of the heat is generated at the welding tip. That heat breaks down that oxide. Uh, when it's uh, on the DCEN, DC electrode negative side, only a third of the heat, about 30%, is generated at the tip, and that's not enough to break it down. So if you're going to be using DCEN, which is mostly what's done for uh, uh, welding uh, carbon and, and high-strength low-alloy steels and so forth, um, you're not going to get any cleansing action. So that's why we use an AC, because you get the best of both worlds. 
You can break it down on the, on the DC electrode positive side, and then you make your weld with the DC electrode negative side. So flip the page, uh, bullet, where it says the best welding methods for aluminum are the gas tungsten arc welding uh, method and the gas metal arc welding method. And those of you that have taken uh, Weld 1770 got an opportunity to weld some aluminum using the gas metal arc method. It's really fast. Um, I've always had some questions about whether or not the amount of penetration is as great as, as with TIG. I don't think it is, but uh, it's certainly much faster. And, um, you know, it's great for building bumpers and trailers and things like that. Because of the shielding gas, each of these uh, techniques offers good protection of, for the weld pool. The gas shield is transparent so that the welder can see the fusion zone. And this helps in making nearer, neater and sounder welds. Now, this is a bullet. One disadvantage of the welding of aluminum is the fact that it does not change color when it approaches the melting point, as most metals do. Uh, of course, when you're welding with, with uh, shielded metal arc, the metal is going to heat up red and then white and then it's going to melt finally away. You can be welding aluminum and it, it won't change color and you can be welding along and if you're not careful with that heat suddenly the bottom of, of the plate that you're welding on can simply fall out on you. It falls out because it got a little too hot and it got a little too hot through a phenomenon called uh, hot shortness. Write that down. Hot shortness. Now, the glossary in your textbook defines hot shortness as a metal's tendency towards brittleness at elevated temperatures. But the way, the, the way it's used in, in conjunction with aluminum, and also copper, is that it loses that, that tensile strength. And that's what makes it fall out on you. Hot shortness. So remember that term. And it'll do it without you realizing it because it doesn't change color. So there's two things there you should remember. It doesn't change color whenever it gets hot and the term hot shortness, that it'll fall out. And what does that mean? It's going to fall out on you. Um, staying in the middle of that paragraph, it says, the flux required when welding with other processes also causes a glare in the weld pool and emits a considerable amount of smoke. Uh, for example, using stick rod, uh, that's going to produce an awful lot of smoke, or, or dual shield is going to produce an awful lot of smoke. However, when TIG welding, there is no glare or smoke, and the weld pool is clearly visible to the welder. So that would be another heads up. Dropping down to the last paragraph in that column, it says uh, all types of aluminum alloys can be welded with the TIG process, including those alloys in the 1,000, 1,100, 3,000, 5,000, 6,000, and 7,000 series. And then here it says alternating current with stabilization is recommended. Welding is possible with current uh, direct current electrode negative, but it is not as successful as with stabilized alternating current. And the shielding gas is usually argon. Now, if you look at this slide I put up, this is the equipment that you would use for AC welding of aluminum. And in that last booth that we have um, over there by the x-ray room, we have this, almost this exact machine. Uh, this is set up for TIG. Here's your gas. Of course, we use a manifold, but, but here they're, they're using a cylinder. Here's your flow meter. Uh, here's your line coming down. Power supply coming into the wall. Uh, water cur coolant circulation unit. We have one of those. It's also a miller, just like this one is. And the reservoir is down here in the bottom, and we have antifreeze in there. Uh, and we re re uh, refill that whenever it's necessary. Whenever you turn on the power supply, the, the cooling pump automatically comes on so that it's circulating and keeping the head cool. Uh, this is our power source controls and high frequency. When we, you're welding with aluminum, you have to have high frequency to kick it over that null point, as we talked about before. Whenever, the, whenever alternating current changes from DC electrode positive to DC electrode negative, over that null point, it needs that little extra kick to get it, get it past there, uh, and that's what high frequency does. And then here we have all of our various controls. And down here you have a remote foot control. And this is what you want to use to control your, your uh, amperage input to, to the weld whenever you're welding aluminum. I talked about hot shortness and, without, and the metal not changing color. So if you think you're getting close to that, you can, you can back off that foot feed. Uh, it's just like a, a gas pedal. You can back off and the amount of amperage that's, that's going to the weld will slow down. And that will help stabilize the puddle so that won't, won't fall out on you. Also, whenever you step on this foot feed, it initiates the solenoid, which starts the gas flow. 
And then you can set your high frequency controls up here for, for just start, to have high frequency just on the start, or to have continuous high frequency. You can also create a sine wave uh, uh, so that you can, you can ramp up, stay up, and then drop down. And you can change the wave form of the AC that you're using uh, to better stabilize your, your welding arc. And then finally, all you have is your ground clamp. Over here is your water-cooled torch. It's hard to see here, but here's your water-cooled torch. So this is the system that you would use for welding aluminum. You're not going to weld a aluminum using the dry rigs that you're learning on right now. Okay. And one last final thing on hot shortness. I want to I want to write this on the board and please make a note of it. This is a this is the uh, American Welding Society definition of it. Hot shortness. is a condition in which a metal loses strength prior to melting. So write that down because you will have a question about hot shortness on your test. Hot shortness is a condition in which a metal loses strength prior to melting. And with copper or aluminum, it'll fall out on you if you don't support the bottom of it in some manner. Okay, let's go ahead and go on back to your book now. And under plate preparation, aluminum, we've already talked about the oxide, so you want to make sure that's all cleaned up but you can also contaminate it with your hand, oil off your hand and such. Uh, reading the last paragraph or the last sentence in that column, it says, any contaminant such as oil or grease must be removed from the prepared surface. Uh, in addition to the contamination that may be on the surface of the plate due to joint preparation, there is also an oxide film. It is necessary to remove this material from the plate before welding. Contamination may be removed from the surface with caustic soda, with acids and with certain solutions. Mechanical methods include wire brushing, scraping, filing, and the use of stainless steel wool. Uh, the interval between cleaning and welding should be as short as possible since aluminum reoxidizes rapidly. So there's a lot of information right there and that's an important paragraph. And one anecdote from my own uh, experience, I was at uh, American Airlines in Tulsa, Oklahoma and I went there to do a week-long class on, on pipe welding for some, some young men. They were about 16, 17 high school kids. I think they were Explorer Scouts. And of course, I got a tour of the facilities and you know, I saw their electron, um, electron beam welding vacuum chamber and things of that nature. And I went over and I talked to a guy that was welding some aluminum parts for one of the aircraft. And I reached down and I picked it up like this and he just had a hissy fit because I had now contaminated that part that he had just cleaned in preparing uh, to weld. And so he had to stop and re-clean it and get it ready ag again because just touching it like that, and that's all I did, just, just about that fast, and I had recontaminated it and he had to stop and get it all cleaned up again because, of course, aircraft, you can't have any mistakes and you can't have any fit metal fatigue, any porosity, any discontinuities of any, of, of any kind. So he was pretty upset. I made him some extra work just from that little thing. And they, they, they clean those things chemically. I'm not, I, I can't tell you what they used. I think it was acetone, but I'm not certain about that. Okay, preheating. Um, aluminum alloys are of two types. Work hardenable alloys, uh, such as EC, 1100, 3003, et cetera, et cetera, and heat treatable alloys. So remember those two terms work hardenable alloys and heat treatable alloys. When they say work hardenable, hardenable uh, you can look back in the glossary in your textbook and, and it's defined back there on page 1230 and it says work hardenable. Uh, the capacity of a material to harden as the result of cold rolling or other cold working involving deformation of the metal. So if you were to take it and, and 
send it through a press where you're pounding it like this, that's a form of work hardening. And they do that to, to some aluminums and to copper, some copper alloys, to make, it, um, make the surface a little hard and a little more hard. So uh, for, for various applications. Uh, drop down to the next paragraph, and this is a bullet. Actually, there's two bullets. The next two paragraphs have, each have a bullet. It says, heat treatable alloys may be preheated to keep cracking to a minimum. These alloys are heated at temperatures above 900 degrees Fahrenheit and then given a slow temperature aging treatment above 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Heat treatment is not generally required in the welding of work hardenable al aluminum alloys, but only in the, uh, in the heat treatable ones. Uh, preheating is necessary, and this is another bu bullet, preheating is necessary if the mass of the base metal is such that the heat is conducted away from the joint so fast that the welding art cannot supply the heat required to produce fusion. So you have to preheat it essentially so that you'll properly tie in and you don't want to preheat it too much. Uh, our our book's, book is saying uh, above 300 degrees, so you want to take it up to about 300 degrees, start your weld, and giving it that preheat, you, you reduce the rapidity with which the, that, the heat from the welding arc is going to be drawn off. And so that allows you to get better fusion. And the area adjacent to that weld is called the heat affected zone, and we want to slow that down. It's a heat sink. So we want to, we want to raise the temperature there so that the heat is not drawn off quite so rapidly, and it will give us better fusion. And I have seen uh, plate metal, V-groove plate metal with, in aluminum, half inch thick, uh, where this happens. You, you actually end up with cold lap, where, overlap, where it rolls over and just lays against the, the bevel and doesn't fuse in uh, because of this phenomenon, because they, they, they improperly, uh, they had an improper procedure, they simply didn't preheat it enough. And it says um, it will produce a, a lack of fusion. Insufficient heat results in poor fusion of the weld bead and an adequate melting of the base metal. Preheating the parts being joined helps to produce a satisfactory weld, reduces distortion and cracking in the finished product, and increases welding speed. And here's another bullet. Mechanical properties of certain aluminum alloys will decline with excessive preheat temperatures. So you can get, you can get overblown with that. So if you're ever asked to, to do uh, some welding on heat treatable material, research the material. Find out what it is first. Find out there should be a welding procedure that you should use that your your company provides for you, uh, but if they don't, then take it upon yourself to go to the book and look it up and see how it should be welded. The American Welding Society puts up a, a, a lot of books. One is called uh, The Weldability of Metals, and it, it covers all of this stuff, and it will give you, it will guide you in how to do this if, if you have questions about that. And also, uh, watch the training films for gas tungsten arc welding. In gas tungsten arc welding, they'll show you some of these techniques, so don't just listen to these lectures. Those training films that go along with this course are very important for you to understand how aluminum and stainless steel and carbon steel should be welded. Okay, uh, next page where it says welding techniques, bullet. Because aluminum alloys have, re have relatively high coefficient of thermal expansions compared, compared with most weldable metals, there may be a problem with distortion whenever unequal expansion and contraction occurs. If you re remember, um, expansion and contraction, the coefficient of thermal expansion is, uh, real briefly again, atoms have a home base in the structure of a steel and, and they sit there and they're constantly under vibration. As you dump heat into there, that vibration increases and they begin bumping into the atoms next to them. Those atoms begin bumping into the atoms next to them and so the overall piece of plate is going to grow. That is your coefficient of thermal expansion. Uh, and aluminum has a very high coefficient of thermal expansion, so it's going to uh, grow a great deal. And that leads to distortion. It says, you will recall that control of distortion is a matter of proper design, joint preparation, and fit up, choice of welding process, and the use of the proper welding sequence. Uh, the planning, in planning the sequence of welding, individual pieces and members must have freedom of movement. Uh, this is a bullet. Joints that are likely to contract a great deal should be welded first. Welding should be done on both sides of the structure at the same time and alternated from one side to the other to equalize stresses. Uh, the weld should be completed as rapidly as possible without interruption. So those are all some hints and techniques that you can use to help minimize distortion. It says because of the high thermal conductivity of aluminum, a very high heat input must be maintained in the weld zone to balance the heat loss to the adjacent metal. And that goes back to what we were talking about earlier about the need to preheat it so that we can get proper fusion. Uh, over in the next column, a bullet where it says when welding aluminum, 
it is a good practice to ball or round the end of the electro before welding uh, to keep the arc steady. The ball is required with conventional AC sine wave power sources. That's the same kind of power source we have there in the welding lab. Uh, a more tapered tungsten can be used with the enhanced square wave type power source. Okay, that's all this chapter really says about aluminum. Flip the page, and we're going to start talking about carbon. And we're on page 684 now. Bullet, when welding carbon steels, the best results are obtained with direct current electrode negative. Use argon as the shielding gas and ceruleum, uh, thenanium, or thoriated electrode with a tapered electrode tip. The sharpened electrode makes it easier to control the arc and the weld bead size. Because the current is DCE in, it takes a lot of heat to melt the sharpened electrode. Make sure that the electrode does not touch the weld pool. The molten weld will contaminate it and cause an erratic arc. Use a filler rod that matches the base metal. So you've got four things there. You've got your power source, you've got your tungsten type, you've got your shielding gas, and you've got, uh, you've got your, your filler metal or your filler rod to match the base metal. Um, dropping down, it says you can use the high frequency start, the lift, the lift arc, or the touch start control feature. Um, we don't have high frequency on our dry rigs. We have the lift arc. If you just open that face panel and look in there, you can see lift arc, where you will simply touch the tungsten to the metal and then pull it away. And then when you pull it away and establish your arc length, it will ramp up to your welding temperature. Or that you can use the scratch start, where you simply touch it and it'll, it'll go ahead and begin. When you just touch it and, and, and break it off, you're liable to lose a little tiny piece off the tip of your tungsten. So it will consume your tungsten a little faster. So my recommendation is to use the lift arc while you're in here, but also experiment with that scratch dart because a lot of companies that you may have to do work for won't have the lift arc feature. You'll have to do the scratch art out in the field. Um, let's see. The scratch dart is not recommended because the weld or tungsten can be contaminated, especially with the inverter type power sources. Well, that's what I, what I just discussed. You can either break off the tip or you get contamination from the parent metal whenever you're doing that. This next is a bullet. Uh, less heat is needed to start the weld pull in carbon steel than al aluminum. And again, that goes back to uh, the amount of how, how rapidly that heat is drawn away. So you've got to increase that heat or even preheat aluminum. Um, about the only reason you really preheat uh, mild carbon steel would be to drive the moisture out of it so that you don't get any porosity. There are other in, uh, instances where you preheat carbon steel, but that's usually when you're welding with a high strength, low alloy carbon steel and you've changed the, uh, the properties of the base metal. Uh, continuing here, I'm at the bottom of the column, it says a foot operated heat control is not absolutely necessary when welding carbon. Uh, the welding heat can be controlled by varying the travel speed. So. I've talked to you, I'm sure, many times by now that, uh, about how the amount of heat input into the weld is a combination of the amperage and how fast you're moving, and that's what they're telling us here. Uh, stainless steels, a lot of stuff out of stainless steels. Um, you're probably going to get close to 10 questions out of stainless steel. So, bullet, stainless steel is one of the most widely used of all the alloys. It is suitable for all types of welded fabrications in which strength and resistance to high temperatures pressure and corrosion are desired. Um, those are all, you can get chemical corrosion, you can get heat corrosion, uh, you can get fly ash corrosion. There's all types of different corrosion that, that stainless steel is subjected to and that's why they put that chromium in, in carbon steel to make it stainless because the chromium helps to fight that, that corrosion that you see. Uh, the chromium and, and, and additions of nickel help to, f help to high, fight uh, high temperature fatigue. So that's another reason you'll, you'll get some of those in there. Uh, says root passes laid down by gas tungsten arc welding are always specified for X-ray quality welds in large heavy walled pipe for nuclear power plants and other critical services. Stainless steel is made in all standard shapes and forms, just like carbon steel is. Uh, you will recall from chapter three that there are three general types of stainless steel and all will be welded with, can be welded with the gas tungsten arc process. Steels in the 300 series, which is referred to as the austenitic type, uh, are chromium nickel steel alloys. That's a bullet. They are highly weldable. That's a bullet. These steels are hardenable only by cold working, the same way you might harden aluminum or copper. A second type is martinistic steels. 
they are straight chromium stainless steels in the 400 and 500 series. These steels are hardenable by rapid cooling from high temperature. They call that quenching. When they bring it down fast, they're quenching it. Typically, they, they air quench it. Sometimes they might even water quench it or quench it in, in a brine, a salt brine solution. There's lots of ways of quenching things. A third type in the 400 series is ferritic steels. Uh, it has a straight chromium content of approximately 11.5 to 18 percent. Ferritic steels are non-hardenable in, in high carbon chromium combinations. Lower chromium grades may be hardened. Stainless steels have a high resistance to corrosion and high temperature, excellent strength to weight ratios, and a high degree of ductility. Uh, they can be fabricated by the same methods as carbon steel. Their thermal conductivity, however, is about 50% less than that of carbon steel, so heat stays in the weld zone longer. So it's not drawn off as quickly as aluminum, or even, even carbon steel for that matter. And, if, and, and when you get into welding stainless steel, you'll see what they're talking about. It's, it, the, 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 the heat right there is just really intense. It doesn't, it doesn't take off as, as, as fast as, as carbon does. It's just not drawn off as far, fast, so it has a lower heat sink. It stays in the weld zone longer, but its thermal expansion, if, we, if you look at your book, because their thermal expansion is about 50% greater than carbon steel, there is a problem with distortion. Carbon, uh, stainless steel is going to grow more than carbon steel, and the heat's going to take longer to, to, to dissipate. And because it grows more, uh, and this is a bullet, and you're not only going to have a problem with distortion, but whenever you get ready to uh, do some welding with it, and you have to do a, a groove joint, uh, you have to increase the size of the gap on that. I, I have failed an awful lot of people coming in here to take welding tests because they didn't understand that if you have a, if you have a pipe test, and say, say we were welding carbon steel here, and typically we would say, okay, we want a 332 root opening to weld carbon steel. And, and if they're not experienced with stainless, this is the root opening they're going to use, and they'll start to weld it, and this will slam shut on them. Because in welding stainless, this stuff is going to grow so much that it's going to, be, it's going to slam shut, and they won't have any gap in there. It's going to slam shut before they get a chance to put that root pass in. So what you have to do with stainless is increase that. Most welding codes or, or, or most procedures will say something like 332nd root opening, but then it'll say plus or minus 1 16th. So you're going to go to a maximum that they allow. If you, if you add those together, you can go all the way up to a 532 root opening. 532 root opening then gives you more space and you can get that root pass in there without it slamming shut. And that's just because this stuff will grow so much. And as you, as you go through this, and uh, you're going to be doing plate, you'll have groove welds, but it, they'll be plate groove welds, like so, and you're going to put them on those purge boxes. You're going to have to make that root opening about 532. Try one at 332 and see the difference. See the difference. By the time you get to the end, it will probably be so, so tight on you that you'll have a difficult time uh, getting full penetration in there. So that's a very important idea, something that you need to remember, and that's why it will be on your test. Drop down to the next paragraph bullet and highlight this. Stainless steel can be successfully welded with either direct current electrode negative or alternating current with stabilization. Much greater penetration and welding speed can be obtained with direct current electrode negative. When welding with DCEN, high frequency is usually used only to start, start the weld. Uh, once you've established that, you don't, have to, you don't have to go on. And the reason they use high frequency to start the weld is because then you don't even have to touch the tungsten to the, to the material. Uh, and that will preserve the tungsten and also keep any contamination from getting into the uh, stainless steel. Next paragraph, bullet. A 1 or 2 percent cerium, thaninum, or thoriated tungsten electrode is used. We use the 2 percent thoriated uh, bullet. Either argon or helium or a mixture of these gases may be used as a shielding gas. Argon provides smoother arc action and gives good results when welding on the thinnest gauges. Helium 
Uh, shielding produces a hotter arc than argon and permits higher welding speeds and deeper penetrations, particularly on heavy materials. Um, when we use a trimix with gas metal arc welding to weld stainless steel, it has about 7.5% helium in there. And, and the, for the very reason that it says here, because it produces a, harder, a hotter arc. And you need that additional heat to break down the, the, the stainless steel. That chromium, remember, is heat resistant. So you got to get the, the arc a little bit hotter in some, some applications in order to uh, uh, get, a, get a, a good weld. Drop down to where it says shielding. Shielding the backside of the weld may be necessary uh, to prevent oxidation and promote maximum corrosion resistance. One method is to introduce argon or a backup powder under the weld with some type of backing device to confine the gas to the weld area. So this is a, this is a bullet here. Uh, you have to be able to, to uh, uh, back, purge, back purge the weld, otherwise it's going to oxidize. Uh, this is why we use these, these purge boxes. Now if you're out there in the field and, uh, and you're making a stainless weld, you, you, you have to, you have to uh, back purge it. And let me give you one example. Out there they have a thing called uh, purge paper. And it's, this is just a piece of old typewriter paper. But it, it's, it, it's about this color. It's about twice as thick as this. And you, wanna, you want to take whatever you're welding on, say, say it was one of these little two inch Schedule 80 pipes, and you see a lot of these in power plants. What you want to do is you want to make a cone out of this and you just tear off what you need and then you simply roll it. If any of you have ever had to make a quick funnel to siphon gas or pour gas or something like that, you know what I'm talking about. You just make a funnel like that, bend over the end like so, and then you put it into the tube. And then usually you use a welding rod or something like that to shove it on in and you can see how it fills the entire space. You're going to shove this back down the tube far enough that it's out of the weld area so that the heat of the, of the arc won't burn it. So you, you might shove it back down here, you know, a foot or so to get it away from there. And you'll do that on both sides. Then you take, take a bicycle tube, pardon me, a, 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 a basketball needle and stick it in here to fill it up with, with shielding gas so it's back purged so that it, it can't oxidize on you. Uh, that's a technique that I talked about before, but I didn't talk about purge paper. Uh, so write that off in the column someplace, purge paper. You should understand how purge paper works now. It's water soluble. So what, what they'll do is when they're all done, they, they typically run water through the system. And the, syst the, the water then will, will break that down uh, into a slurry, kind of feels like snot and uh, then it just dissolves, dissol dissolves away. Alternatively, if purge paper isn't available, you're going to use toilet paper. And you can plug it with toilet paper, but this isn't as, as uh, they don't like this as well as purge paper, but in a pinch you can use toilet paper to do that, but most of, most of the time they're going to use a purge paper. Okay, now I'd like you to turn to uh, page three and uh, go, back, go back to page three where it says all, all of your color stuff. It says see, see the color insert section for the color indications that denote the amount of acceptable oxidation when welding stainless steel pipe and tubing in the food processing industry. And uh, that's, back, that's back in chapter three and in chapter three in chapter 3, it begins on page, let me find it here, it begins right after page 48 in your textbook. And you'll see you get some nice, pretty, color, glossy photographs there. Flip that open to page 3 and look at the bottom, look at the bottom picture. And what we have here, this is the same thing you have in your book. What this is, you can see it's a thin wall tube this is probably a Schedule 10 tube. And they've made a series of welds here to illustrate what oxygen and other, other atmospheric contaminants can do to the backside of a stainless weld. Reading from the caption, it says, weld discoloration levels on inside of austenitic stainless steel pipe. Sample 
one, all the way over here, has 10 parts per million of oxygen. Sample five has 200 parts per million, and you can see how gray it's gotten. Uh, and then sample 10 has over 25,000 parts per million. Sample five and under are, are generally considered acceptable uh, in the as welded condition. Proper purging is critical for hygienic quality welds. When they're talking about hygienic, that's uh, a, typically a food application. If any of you work in the, uh, in the soda ash mines, that's considered a food product. And so this is the type of, uh, of uh, weld you'd be looking at. Uh, typically they would use 304 and 308 stainless steel uh, piping for that because that's considered food quality. So you can see here how, how clean and white and silvery that is. This is great. Number two is great. Number three, now we're starting to get a little discoloration and it's because of oxygen contamination and it goes right on down the line. And not only does it cause oxidation, but it also inhibits the, the flow of the weld pool. You'll actually get better flow of the weld metal if you, if you have it properly purged on the backside than if you don't. So study that. There will be a question about this picture on your test. Okay then. Now back to page 685. The type of welding, I'm picking up in the middle of that paragraph, the type of welding current and polarity have a large effect on the welding penetration. Developments have been made in producing chemical fluxes that affect the surface tension of the weld pool molecules and allow improved penetration on certain metals. The flux is applied prior to welding and for a given amperage, penetration will be increased. And all that is, it's a paint. It's like a paste that you can paint on the backside or in, inside of the weldment. Uh, and that will help, uh, help with uh, greater penetration. I've never seen that, I've never done that, but it's, it's, a, it's a new development that's out there. Uh, next paragraph says, this is a bullet, one of the principal differences between welding stainless steel and aluminum is that aluminum requires more heat and a faster speed of travel. Uh, take care in the selection of a filler rod size. If the rod diameter is too large, it will soak up a good deal of the heat and make welding more difficult. Uh, bullet on the, in the next paragraph, it is important that the filler rod match the type of stainless steel being welded. Um, we'll, get to, we'll get to welding rods here in a minute, but briefly, a welding rod, if it's a stainless, it'll say E308, meaning it's a 308 stainless, and you're going to use that to weld 308 or a 304 product. Um, that's tip generally how you match them up. You just, you just identify the type of material that you're welding on and then you get a, a, the corresponding correct filler rod for that. Although most, typically I think the higher the number in stainless, you can weld anything below that is, is a, as a general rule. Uh, it is important that the filler rod match the type of stainless steel being welded. The rod must also deposit metal that has the physical and chemical properties that the job requires. I've seen welds crack out because they use the wrong stainless to weld something, and it, 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 it just cracks right, up, right back out on them. So you got to, it's very important, and that will be a bullet. Travel speed is slow with relatively low heat, and it takes considerable skill to keep from burning through thin sections. Because stainless steel distorts much more than carbon and low alloy steels during welding, proper tacking, weld sequencing, and clamping are important. Now there's something else here that your book doesn't discuss and I want to go over it real quick. Um, first of all, one last thing about, uh, about our aluminum. I, I should have talked about this earlier. When we were talking about aluminum, you have pure aluminum, aluminum copper alloys, and aluminum magnesium alloys. And then under copper, and we'll get to copper in a minute, you have pure copper, brasses, and bronzes. So these are some of the different alloys that you can find uh, in those non-ferrous materials. Coefficient of thermal expansion, I talked about this before. Remember, every, every metal has a coefficient of thermal expansion. It's a measurement that determine, they, can, they actually can, can figure this out mathematically. If you dump in so much heat, this metal is going to grow, and you can see it's distorting here. Uh, as it becomes liquid, it begins to distort. The heat is sucked away, that's what these arrows do, are showing. Uh, and so the, the, the metal is getting hot or warm out, out even farther away from the whale pool. As it cools, it contracts. 
as it contracts, it bows the material back in the, in the opposite direction. And this little squiggly line uh, is indicative of residual stresses left in the weld. So aluminum has, has this, uh, stainless has this, um, low, high strength low alloy steels have this, carbon steel has this, they all have this, but they'll expand and contract at different rates. Now this is what I wanted to talk to you about that is not in your book, so pay attention to this. A corrosion attack of austenitic stainless steel. Well, we use stainless steel because it has corrosion resistance. We, we already talked about how in a corrosive environment, if it gets attacked by chemicals or something like that, it's designed not to fail, not to be consumed. Well, you can see that, that the corrosive uh, environment ate this away. And, and why did it eat it away? Because when they made this weld, the heat of welding changed this material out here. And what it did was it caused the chromium that's in this base metal to combine with the iron that's in this base metal. And when it combined, or, pardon me, uh, combined with the uh, carbon in this base metal. And when it did that, it formed uh, uh, chromium carbides. And it locked up that chromium so that it could no longer protect the base metal. And so the corrosive environment that this metal was uh, exposed to got its way with it. It just ate it up because the chromium was essentially taken out of the parent metal uh, through welding. And why? They call it the sensitization of austenitic alloys. So remember that term, sensitization. You, it, you've sensitized the, uh, the chromium, the, the stainless steel, and it is the formation of chromium carbides, and that occurs between 800 and 1600 degrees Fahrenheit. So when you're ramping up to weld, you're going to pass through this heat zone. Because remember, carbon melts at about 2800, stainless melts at about the same, maybe a little more. And then as it cools off, it's going to pass through that heat zone again. So you can't help it. It's going to pass through there, and, and you could have this problem of sensitization. And so what happens, for sensitization reduces the corrosion resistance in many environments, in many corrosive environments. How do you stop it? It is a big problem. How do you stop it? Avoiding sensitization. Well, you can do it through heat treatment. Uh, you can quench it, and that's what this Q stands for. If the part is small enough, you can, you can quench it uh, in a chemical solution, and that will help to, to stop the, uh, the corrosion. More commonly, you use what they call stabilized grades. And when they stabilize a stainless steel, what they're doing is they're adding another element. It's usually columbium or niobium. They're adding one of those two elements and then instead of that, that chromium binding with carbon, it would rather bind with the columbium. So it's like going to the dance and you, know, you like the brunette instead of the redhead. So it's attracted to the brunette. That's what it does. So it combines with the chromium and the columbium and it, makes, uh, it, it still retains its, its, its corrosion resistant properties that way. If they don't put that in there, then it's gonna go to that redhead and form uh, uh, chromium carbides, and that's just gonna, gonna take that, lock that chromium up to where it can't do that corrosion resistance. So that's, that's the main way that people do it, that, that companies do that. They'll use stabilized grades. The other is to use low carbon grades. If you don't have any carbon in, in that stainless for the chromium to combine with, then it can't combine with it, and therefore it will retain its corrosion resistant properties. So if you are using a low carbon grade of stainless steel, it might say 308L. There'll be an L following that 308. The L means it's a low carbon grade. So pay attention to that. You may have a question on sensitization. Um, what is it? What is, what is chromium carbides? What is corrosive attack? So it's a very important concept, and I'm throwing it at you now because as we go on, and, and, and especially if you take the stainless steel welding class, we'll be repeating it again because it is a very important concept. Now, back to your textbook. Magnesium. There's going to be one question on your test about magnesium. And it's going to be coming out of that, that uh, the, one, of the one of the first two paragraphs. And it says, many people mistake magnesium for aluminum because they are similar in appearance and characteristics. Magnesium is a very light material. It is about two-thirds the weight of aluminum and one-quarter the weight of steel. The melting point of magnesium is 1204 degrees. 
while the melting point of aluminum is 1218 degrees. Strength to weight ratio of magnesium alloys is good. The thermal conductivity is relatively high. It's a little bit less than aluminum. Welding magnesium is similar to welding aluminum. The same type of joints and methods of joint preparation are used. Careful cleaning of the workpiece is always required since magnesium oxidizes readily. The parts should be degreased by chemical cleaning and or mechanical clean with ad adhesives. Uh, skip that next paragraph then it says either alternating current with stabilization or DCEN may be used. The shielding gas may be argon or helium. Okay, go over to the next part, titanium. Uh, you're going to have, um, my notes say I have three questions on titanium. So read all of that on titanium. Um, read that first column. Over in the top of the next column, that first paragraph it says if Grinding or sanding is used to clean titanium or prepare a joint. Be very care, uh, cautious of the fine titanium dust particles that might be thrown off. Titanium is flammable, and the smaller the dust particles, the more flammable they are. Just like in, a, in one of these storage grain bins, these big silos, when they dump all that, all that corn and such in those silos, it, it, it creates a dust, and that dust is explosive. Same thing with titanium. Titanium uh, can actually burn. It's flammable. So uh, you want to be careful whenever you're cleaning it. Um, over on the next page it says, uh, when welding titanium or one of its alloys, the filler metal should closely match the alloy content of the base metal being welded. Shielding of the titanium weld and surrounding metal, including the hot end of the filler rod, that, uh, that reach temperatures of 500 degrees is required. When doing manual open air welding, that is not in a bubble or totally enclosed chamber, that would be one of these, one of these chambers where you would put your gloves inside and you'd actually weld it in, in kind of a vacuum. Uh, care must be taken to prevent atmospheric contamination of the titanium. Since titanium has a very low thermal conductivity, it stays hot for a long time after the welding arc has moved along the joint. So because of that, uh, uh, trailing gas is essential to have one. So you're going to, you're going to weld, and there's a picture, uh, there's a picture of, of a fixture that would do this and, uh, right below there, it says 19-2. You see it's got, a, it's got a, a, a little tube attached to it. So you're welding, but there's also a mechanism that will come along and keep the, keep the, the weld pull cool or shielded uh, after you've welded. Because you're welding a log like so, and, and your heat's being generated right here at the tip, but all this trailing stuff behind you is still hot. It's still above that 500 degrees. If it's above that 500 degrees, it st can still become contaminated. So you have to have that trailing shielding gas to keep it protected from the atmosphere until it cools down below that 500 degree threshold. And it says that this can be accomplished with a large gas lens on the torch or a trailing gas shoe that attaches to the torch. Uh, this metal shoe has a porous metal diffuser to allow the gas to blanket the titanium until it has cooled below its oxidation temperature. So that's another important concept about titanium. Over in the next column, uh, about the middle of that uh, last section, it says, if the backside of the joint is going to be exposed to the oxidation temperatures over 500 degrees, it must also be protected from the atmosphere. So if you're welding on something on the top side, but it, you're also getting the bottom side of whatever you're welding hot, and that, that heat generated down there exceeds 500 degrees, then you've got to shield it back down there too. So understand that. Uh, copper and its alloys. The weldability of each copper alloy group depends largely on the alloying elements. Um, that's the middle of that paragraph, so you have to consider what type of a, of a copper alloy you're welding. We talked about bronzes and, and brasses a, a moment ago. So again, you go back, go back to that textbook, the weldability of metals that AWS puts out, and that would give you suggestions. Over in the next column, it says, while pure copper presents no great difficulty in welding, many of its alloys require special treatment. The following copper alloys lend, lend themselves to welding, and they've got some bulleted items there that, that discuss those. Uh, the next two paragraphs are bullets. Those copper alloys containing zinc, tin, or lead are either difficult or impossible to weld. These materials have a low melting point that causes them to volatize under the intense heat of the arc. Uh, they can be successfully brazed, however, with the oxyacetylene process. Uh, DCEN is used for welding pure copper and most copper alloys. At the bottom of that paragraph, it reads, uh, current 
settings should be higher for copper and its alloys than for most other metals because of their high thermal conductivity. Uh, copper has a tendency to form oxides, which must be removed just before welding. Just like, uh, actually copper will turn green if it's exposed too much, and, th and that's a sure sign that you've got uh, oxidation on it. Nickel and nickel-based alloys, these are important because you will run into them. Uh, in fact, you may be given welding tests using some of these materials. I want you to know and understand about monels. Monels, which are about two-thirds nickel and one-third copper, and inconels. Inconels are very common uh, in, in the workplace. Inconels, which are higher in nickel and iron content than monels. They are outstanding in their ability to resist damage from abrupt changes in temperature. And then finally, the hastaloys. Hastaloys are alloys of nickel, molybdenum, and iron. They have a high resistance to acids. So know those three terms. There'll be, there'll be at least one question coming out on that, which brings me to my first overlay. If you'll take a look here. This is on the next page. I believe, let's see. No, it's on that same, it's on page um, 691. And I wanted to show you this, or draw your attention to this, uh, because these are, these are dissimilar welds, okay? So if you're welding stainless steel to cast iron, that's two different metal products. That's two different types of metal. So that would be considered a dissimilar weld. And you're gonna use DCEN and uh, you can weld nickel to stainless type rod using an ox weld number 26. That's, this R means it's a, it's a registered name. I put some bullets by some of these and, and boxed them in because these are really the common ones that you might run into. Stainless to carbon or low alloy steel, that's a dissimilar weld. Typically you can weld it with 310 stainless. Uh, last job I came off of that I, that I did some inspection on, uh, we welded those with Inconel, I believe. It was either Inconel or 316 stainless. Uh, over here, Hastaloy Alloy C, which is carbon, to steel. You're going to weld it with Inconel, Nickel, or 310 stainless. And then stainless steel to Inconel. This is something else that's, that's pretty common. This one right here, the stainless to carbon to low, low alloy steel, is the most common dissimilar weld that you're going to run into. You need to remember the name, the term dissimilar. We'll, we'll read that in your text in a second. I kind of got ahead of myself just a little bit showing you the slide. Stainless steel to end canal. Happens a lot. 310 stainless. Doesn't always have to be 310 stainless. This is just simply what your book says. Uh, the concept here, the term here to remember is, is stainless. Um, is, pardon me, is, is uh, dissimilar. And you'll see on page three. 690, welding dissimilar metals. Bullet, read that entire paragraph, understand what they mean when they say dissimilar metals. Um, okay, filler metals. This is going to be our next, oops, just real briefly here. Your book says, okay, that you, your book says that you are urged to become familiar with the AWS specifications for filler metals. These are them. We'll talk about these more in the inspection class for those of you that go on. Gas tungsten arc welding filler metals, okay? They're not electrodes. Remember, your electrodes are your tungstens. Your filler metals are just long bare rods. They're, they're written ER70S-2, ER70S-3, and so forth. Your stainless steels are ER308, ER308L, remember the L means low carbon, ER316, and so forth. That's how they're going to be read. Uh, and if you look on, on, the, on the filler rods that you're checking out of the tool room, they'll either have numbers stamped on them like this, or they'll have a little tiny piece of paper called a flag on the ends of them, on each end, and, and they'll be flagged with these same numbers. Electrode rod... XXS-X. Okay, so electrode rod 70,000S-2-3, whatever it was. And you notice it says gas metal arc welding electrode identification system. Well, guess what? They use the same one for TIG. Same one for TIG, only under TIG, it's a filler metal. 
when with gas metal arc, it's an electrode because it's, it's actually conducting electricity. But they're going to use the same. So we might, we might have E70, ER70S-2, which would be an electrode for the gas metal arc process, or it could be a, a, a bare filler metal for the gas tungsten arc process. But the numbers still mean the same. These two would be strength. This one would be telling you the S is, tells you that it's a solid wire, whether it's a, a, a coiled up on a spool or just a bare three foot long wire. S means solid. And then S, the, the suffix, is the chemical composition. You know, what's in that bare metal. So that's, that's a, a real brief down and dirty talk about, uh, about these, these filler rods. So don't get them confused with an electrode. When you go to get that filler rod, it's called a filler rod. It is not called an electrode unless you're doing the gas metal arc system. Okay, back to your text. We're almost done here. Go to uh, 693. They talk about they talk about uh, backing in your textbook. This is this is uh, this is that diagram in your book on page 693. It says the joint should be backed up on many gas tungsten arc welding operations. Backing protects the underside of the weld from atmospheric contamination. So you have to take all of these different types of backing bars that they put in there, get a good solid seal around there so that your, your gas will, will protect both sides. For example, your, your shielding gas will come down in here, hit this, and not go anywhere else. So it's you're, you're protecting the backside while you're welding. Same thing here. Here we got a backing bar and it's, your shielding gas is going to penetrate, fill this void, protect the back side. Same thing on all of these. Problem with using a backing bar like that is how are you going to get it out of there? If you're welding pipe, you can't. You can't get it out of there. So it, it's a special application uh, for that. But there's other ways for it to be done. But let me read from your textbook here. It says, atmospheric contamination causes weld porosity, poor surface appearance, cracking, and burn through. Uh, the weld may be backed up by one, metal or ceramic backing bars, which is what this slide illustrates, two, an inert gas atmosphere on the weld underside, which is what I talked about earlier uh, with purge dams, uh, or three, a combination of the first two methods, or four, a flux painted on the backside uh, of the weld, and that flux will be vaporized and thereby shielding it in that way. It says metal backup bars should not actually touch the weld zone. Uh, the material used for uh, making a backup bar is determined by the composition of the material being welded. A copper bar may be used to back up welds in stainless steel. For the welding of aluminum or magnesium, the bar should be made of stainless steel or steel. Carbon steel can be used for carbon steel welding. Very often, backup bars are water-cooled to uh, carry off the heat of the welding operation. And it says, when the final weld composition must conform to extremely rigid specifications, Extra care must be taken to exclude all atmospheric contamination from the weld. This is accomplished by introducing an atmosphere of inert gas on the backside of the weld. Nitrogen may be used for stainless steels, but I've never used it in my 27-year uh, career. Argon should be used for aluminum, magnesium, and other metals that oxidize readily or react uh, with nitrogen at high temperatures. Helium may also be used as a purging gas. Uh, not long ago, I spoke about about the about purge paper and how you need to use purge paper um, but I, I think I forgot to mention that it's called a purge dam when you do that whenever you purge it and you've got it per, you, you've got your purge paper in here and your purge paper in here blocking that up and you fill all of this up with gas it's going to bump into that and where you've got it blocked off, that's called a purge dam. That's another term that you should remember, purge dam. Okay. Um, another way they do this, uh, in, instead of doing a backup bar or even using, using a purge dam and an inert gas, they'll use a, what's called a consumable insert. But we'll get into consumable inserts when we get into pipe welding. And as the name implies, it's something that you stick into the weld joint, and as you're welding, it's consumed, becomes part of the weld. 
Um, okay, let's see. Jump over to page 696 under ARC starting. They've got an awful lot of bulleted items here on ARC starting. Uh, I read through them all and looked at them pretty carefully. The ones I find are important are, are number five. The tungsten must be clean and properly shaped. Uh, number seven is use proper gas cup size. Uh, the, the very first one in the next column Attach the work clamp as close as possible to the weld. Number of reasons. Not only, not only do you have a voltage drop off the farther from your power supply uh, that you are, but you run the risk if you're working on equipment of any kind of, uh, let's say this is a set of rolls. If, if you're welding, I'm not much of an artiste, if you're welding on something over here, and your ground happens to be over here. Now your electrical path is through these bearings and you could score these bearings. So you want to be careful where you attach your ground. You, you would want to bring the ground or the entire power supply over here so that this is your path and you avoid passing a, a welding current through bearings. If you pass welding current through bearings, they're going to arc just like an arc strike that you might get on the surface of your material. You're going to score these bearings create a localized hard, hard, hard spot, and they could actually crack and fall apart. So you want to keep your work clamp as close as possible to where you're welding, and that will help avoid that. Uh, drop down to the third one. It says the weld surface must be clean. If you're going to start the arc, you don't want mill, mill scale or rust or anything like that interfering with you starting the arc. And then finally, one, two, three, four, five, the sixth one from the bottom, use 100% argon shielding gas if possible, because it creates a, a much more stable arc. Okay, almost done. Uh, bullet by where it says four arc starting methods are generally used in TIG welding. High frequency starting, scratch starting, lift arc starting, and high voltage starting. Read about all of those. Um, there will be two questions on those different types of, of ways of, of starting your arc. Uh, flip the page and it says arc wandering read about that now you're familiar with arc blow but here they're giving they're calling it arc wandering because it's more than magnetic fields that that would affect it uh, read about that uh, they're selling saying there's four types a current setting that is too low producing an unstable arc contamination of the electrode very common magnetic effects uh, arc blow and then drafts in the in the work area well Having a draft in the work area would probably be a secondary consideration because you're more likely to get porosity if, from a draft than you are from a, a, a magnetic, uh, pardon me, an arc bow, or a, a wandering from the arc from that. Uh, you don't want any, any drafts in there. Read those first two pair, let's see, first three paragraphs. Uh, then I bulleted the last two. So read those as well. On welding technique, over the next column, I highlighted and bulleted both of those two paragraphs. Let me just read real quickly. It says, when welding light gauge carbon and stainless steel or when heat must be con concentrated on a limited area, the electrode should be sharpened to a point with a long, smooth taper. This ensures that the arc will jump off the designated place each time you start an arc and will continue arcing in the same direction during the entire operation. If you are welding aluminum or magnesium with sine wave alternating current, ball the end of the tungsten. If the electrode becomes contaminated or deformed, do not increase the machine setting. Reshape the tungsten instead. That's just common sense. Um, common sense, once you've got a little experience, you'll understand that. Um, another bullet is a short arc should be maintained. This helps to confine the heat to the immediate area. Be careful to direct the arc only in the exact spot where it is desired to liquefy the metal. To apply heat to any other spot only increases distortion and, and deterioration. Play the arc on the seam to be welded until a molten pool appears. Then proceed as rapidly as possible and make sure that both pieces to be joined become molten under the arc. you got to melt it before you add filler metal, otherwise you're going to have either overlap or lack of fusion. Uh, next page, first paragraph is, is a bullet. The extension of the electrode tungsten beyond the cup is governed by the shape of the object that is to be and the type of the joint. Uh, the longer the extension, the less effective the shielding. Consequently, some adjustment in uh, rate of gas flow is necessary where shapes require longer extensions and loss of shielding occurs. Uh, bullet, a gas lens 
can be used where a, where a long electrode extension is required to aid in, the, in getting the proper gas coverage. The cup size is governed by the type of joint, the shape of the object, and the amount of current used. And a bullet, all torch connections must be kept tight to prevent siphoning of air through the connections. A small amount of contamination can be serious. Basically, it'll suck it up like a pump and it'll mix oxygen with your shielding gas and you won't even realize it's there. So you want to double check all of your, your fittings to make sure that you don't have any leaks. Uh, just get, we use these little bottles that have a, like, it's kind of like a water, watery dish soap and we'll, we'll squirt it on there and it will actually form bubbles if, if there's any kind of a leak once, once that system is pressurized. Uh, general recommendations. This is on page 700. This will be the last page. One thing I wanted to bring your attention to here that I consider the most important was that third bulleted item. It says, uh, prevent shrinkage holes from forming in the weld craters. Do not finish a weld by breaking the arc abruptly. Taper off the weld bead by carrying it off to the side of the weld and by increasing the travel speed so that the weld pool diminishes in size before breaking the arc. Or use the remote, con remote hand or foot control uh, to gradually reduce the welding current or activate the crater control on the power source if so equipped. These shrinkage holes that they're talking about here are referred to as fish eyes. Um, not to offend anybody, but they're also sometimes called uh, assholes. And what, what they have is you're, you're welding like this and you, here you, you'll have a little spot right there and then your weld will go on. And this is where you, where, where you would break the arc and you come out the side and it leaves a, leaves a little sinkhole. And, and your book calls it a shrinkage hole. Uh, they're more commonly referred to in my life as, as uh, fish eyes. And he's, he mentions some good things. Come out slowly. And my recommendation is, is to come out slowly up the side. But as you're coming out, add a drop of your filler metal in there. And if you add a drop of filler metal in there, it's going to fill that in and you won't have that. These are defects. I've actually seen... Uh, another inspector I know, take a needle and push it through one of those fish eyes. So it's a hole. There's a hole right there. It's just, it's, it's, it's more than paper thin. I mean, it's, it's not nearly as thick as a piece of paper and you can actually do that. So try to add a piece of filler metal, and this is, this is a bullet, add a piece of filler metal as you're pulling out of the weld puddle so that you do, do not have these fish eyes. So highlight that, understand that. If you don't understand that, get with me and I'll explain it a little more thoroughly. And finally, over here where it says practice jobs, it says uh, bullet, the practice jobs in this chapter require welding the three metals that are most commonly welded by the gas tungsten arc welding process. The major application of TIG welding is in those fields that make the use of aluminum, carbon and low alloy steels, and stainless steels. Remember before I talked about high strength low alloy steels, HSLA. Those, that's, that's, that's an acronym that you should remember, high strength, low alloy, uh, very important. So make a note of that in your text somewhere. High, when they're talking about low alloy, carbon and low alloy, they're saying high strength, low alloy steels. That's what they mean. Very, very common in the workplace. Uh, these are alloyed metals. They're not straight carbon. They've always got some kind of an alloying element in them. Uh, you're going to weld a lot of them. And then finally, that last paragraph, bullet welding practice will begin with aluminum because this metal is one of the easiest to weld with the TIG process. It has the widest application in industry and it creates a high degree of interest for the student. We actually do that last, but uh, nevertheless, the point to make here is that they consider aluminum to be the easiest to weld of all of them. That's it. I know that was a lot to cover. Uh, if you didn't get it, watch this uh, lecture again or get with me and bring me your book and we'll discuss anything you didn't understand. Thank you very much for your attention.